vocational education qualification framework which you must be all aware of the nveqf framework this was launched conceived by him now called as national skills qualification framework sqf those of you who are attached with the uh, quality accreditations and all that for uh, aict ugc they must be aware of this nsqf which helps in promoting skill based competencies modules to be integrated into seven certification levels where a student can undergo skill based learning that enhances employability and employment opportunities and also allowing him or her the flexibility to pursue a formal education or take up an appropriate job at the end of any level certification a complete credit framework for nsqf has also been developed by him and adopted by mhrd government of india he has also developed course curriculum for more than 15 sectors and 80 specializations the skill program developed for cyber security is one of its kind further this has immense potential to create new job opportunities and aid the make in india program of government of india he implemented the first e governance project automating the workflows for department of higher and technical education government of maharashtra 1985 he currently is an it expert for department of it government of maharashtra and helping in implementing a very prestigious smart city project in nagpur he is also a recipient of fifth national telecom award in 2011 for excellence in education through e governance instituted by cmai and star news he has 278 publications in national and international journals and conferences to his credits he also has 30 phd students who have completed their phd under him dr mantha has also contributed to india's entry to washington accord having participated and proposed several accreditation initiatives of national board of accreditations having been its executive president for 3 years and as the chairman of the board for 3 years dr ss mantha is a prolific writer and writes regularly for all national newspapers prestigious magazines on education science and technology and governance he has more than 250 publications to date today he is here with you all to discuss to present on the topic courage to serve transforming engagement activities into joyful goals i welcome you sir and this would be a privilege to learn from you and on behalf of all the participants i welcome you over to you sir thank you uh, professor nitin arora ji and uh, all the other participants invited guests it's my pleasure to be talking to you all on a subject that concerns us concerns every individual the ability to serve the courage to serve is as important in life as we do anything else as, as probably we breathe and transforming en engagement activities into joyful goals is something that must happen as a matter of routine rather than trying to drive it now the agenda is happiness agenda and try i'll try and build the concepts as we understand into the joyful goals that i'll try and define at some point of time now the agenda that i have for you for today is happiness since the entire program is is based on happiness so i have used education as the context and therefore the some of the examples or some of the anecdotes that i'll be citing are purely from the point of view of education now the big question is is happiness contextual our then i'll take you through to our world and the and the way we understand happiness what should be atmanirbharta in that context 
and of course the spirit of service and giving and we'll look at what the great master adi shankar acharya says and how do we define compassion towards fellow beings in a world when we ourselves don't find any compassion we still hold compassion for others so what is that in this frame of reference what is the role of a leader and what is his engagement with the employee and what is the relationship of an employee with the leader and so on and finally we'll look at what is happiness quotient and how does that come into picture when we really define or try and understand what happiness is all about so the first part is is happiness contextual now personally i feel happiness is a state of mind some of you must have heard this several times that it's a state of mind now if it is a state of mind what does it really mean there are a few questions that i would want to ask can there be happiness without pain without really understanding pain without understanding tragedy can we really define happiness without really understanding the other side of the life and a certain even may elicit happiness in a certain context and may even elicit pain in the same context so therefore is the context important when we understand happiness can a person show no emotion when context around him change can which which must obviously lead to eternal happiness can a person show no emotion when contexts are changing around him the answer i believe is yes there is a state of eternal happiness that one can achieve that state is called sthita pragna which means contented calm and firm in judgment and wisdom so some day when we are contented when our mind is calm and we are firm in judgment and our wisdom is good then probably we are we are looking at or we are somewhere near to what sthita pragna would probably be sthita is existing or being and pragna means a person who is wise so sthita pragna is a person who is truly enlightened which is a minimal condition for true happiness otherwise there are several things in life which will keep pulling you back and therefore we will not be able to attain true happiness or what we call as bliss so let's see what happens here sthita pragna also has something to do with science i'll tell you how in bhagavad gita arjuna says sthita pragna sya ka bhasha samadistasya keshava sthita dihi kim prabhashe kim asit brajet kim how should what language should a sthita pragna speak how should he behave in the society when should he sit when should he stand what is his relationship with the society is what arjuna asks in bhagavad gita what does the lord say yam hi na vyathayantyete purusha purusharakshab samadukha sukham dhiram so amrutatvaya kalpate which means one who is not affected by either sukh or duk and is the context really becomes redundant so therefore first i started with saying that should happiness have a context now i am saying there is a personal there is a certain state of mind where the context actually becomes redundant and that status is sthita pragna when a, and now let's see the link to the signs that we have there is a natural frequency for every body whether you know the the inanimate bodies have 
you know the the intermolecular uh, you know uh, motions do not happen but in uh, in every single body every single body will have a natural frequency and a human body also will have a natural frequency and what is that it is a function of the stiffness and the mass of the body now the point is the human body also has a natural frequency and the outside world exerts a forcing frequency on the human body which means the outside influences your family your environment your social circle the pressures that they bring in that contributes to the external frequency on the human body now if these two frequencies are the same then resonance occurs amplitudes build and possible failures also can occur now suppose we can transcend that state then we are in first harmonics and a certain state of peacefulness occurs if we can raise the bar we move into higher harmonics the second the third the fourth fifth and so on then we eventually become one with the cosmos now how do we raise this bar how do you transcend that state you know where the frequencies become same and the amplitude start building now for that you need practice of yoga practice of meditation which helps and there are higher levels of consciousness that you can reach that is a state of sthita prajna a state of eternal peace leading to happiness now look at the kind of world that we have we have our world of happiness must be looked at from the perspective of dystopia and utopia now what is dystopia it's an imagined state or society in which there is a great suffering or injustice typically one that is totalitarian or post apocalyptic you must have read the novel brave new world by aldous huxley in 1931 that was written in 1931 there was also a similar book 1984 by george orwell or eric blair now they both showed the world as great having great suffering or injustices and things like that as against that there was also another book another work of fiction which is which was a socio political satire by thomas more published way back maybe 500 years back in late latin and that depicts a fictional island society and its religious social and political customs and it shows the future how things should be and what they should be and things like that now our world is actually somewhere between a utopian and dystopian understanding and therefore we must look at how to guard ourselves and get into this world of uh, you know some some uh, a world that lies between an utopian idea and a dystopian idea and then probably we will be able to find that context and the happiness that is associated with it the national happiness rankings are based on cantrell ladder survey now what is that several res respondents are asked in a nation several respondents are asked to think of i mean they they will create different contexts and they will ask them to rate that between 0 and 10 like in a ladder the best is probably 10 and the worst possible life is zero and then they are all asked to rate their own current lives on that 0 to 10 scale so when they when the respondents rank it also it also reflects the satisfaction with their present living conditions and that is a is a measure of the happiness index now thich who was a, a vietnamese buddha uh, you know monk buddhist monk once said we when we are mindful deeply in touch with the present moment our understanding of what is going on deepens and we begin to be filled with acceptance joy peace
and love. And that's something that we must move to. Now, like, having looked at some context setting and the other part of the context, I, I, in, the, in the beginning, I said that all this happiness, I'll try and relate in the context of education. And therefore, I'm now coming back to a little bit of how it can be looked at within education. Education plays a big role in happiness. Then what is the spirit of education? Ano badra krutavo yantu vishwataha. What it means is let noble thoughts come to us from every side. And only when, you, when your mind is healthy, do you actually, you know, feel happiness. Now, this was what Rigveda said. Now, what is the value of education? We all understand. Nachoraharyam, nacharajaharyam, nabhatrubhajyam, nachabhatakari, vyayam krute varzata eva nityam vidyadhanam sarvadhana pradhanam. Nachoraharyam cannot be snatched away by thief. Nacharajaharyam cannot be snatched away by king. Nabhatrubhajyam cannot be divided among brothers. Nachabharakari is not heavy either. If spent daily, it always keeps growing. The wealth of knowledge is the present precious of wealth of all. So therefore, education must be there and effective use of knowledge must be there for happiness. Let's look at the future of our universities. They are metamorphosing post-COVID into several different ways. We all understand that the uh, you know, COVID has brought in a lot of distress and it has disrupted several businesses. Similarly, it has disrupted education as well. So in going to going in future, the business models will change of how you run a university. The cooperative structures enhancing disciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary methodologies will be required. Examinations will have new role. Our idea of degrees will not stand anymore. Fixed, no fixed degree programs will be there. Acceleration in education according to fast innovation cycle, which means everything will become student centric and students will design their, uh, their degrees and they will decide what they want to learn at the pace they want to learn and so on. So that all calls for a different business model. The teaching concepts also will change moving from classroom to flip classrooms. Many universities are already trying out these experiments and so on. There'll be new teaching infrastructure required. No longer your brick and mortar will be required. What you will require is actually a lot of investment in IT infrastructure and so on. Digital rights management will become extremely important. Massive versus personalized learning, exactly tracking what the student wants to learn creating data analytics, using learning management systems, content management systems, and so on. All this becomes extremely uh, you know, prevalent in the future universities. And all of our universities will be AI driven. And every single activity, whether it's marketing, digital marketing, your placements, your academics, your anything you talk about within the university will be driven, will have something to do with artificial intelligence. Now, in that context, my next question is, should universities be run like business houses then? So should future universities be run like, run for pleasing customers and providing service to students? So the first and basic understanding is that, is that a public or a private university is not a business. Now we must understand this. There are multiple stakeholders. There are students, faculty, administrators, parents, and the public who support the institution by paying taxes, providing labor and paying tuition. But at no time they are customers. But in business, the bottom line is measured in profits. At the university, the bottom line is measured in the extent to which we promote the common good through research and teaching. This is all good as, as, a, as, a, you know, as a statement. But most administrative tasks in the modern running of a university, most administrative tasks 
to keep the institution or the university operating are privatized. They are outsourced. Improving efficiency in a time of tight budgets, improving teacher engagement, stakeholder service, diminishing state support, increasing investments in R&D, student-centric learning needing, needs investments in digital technology. People ask for content, which is extreme, which is, which is, which is expensive. Then people will ask for people, for experts to come from other universities, the best of the universities in the world. All that takes money, all that costs money. How then do we move out from a business concept, but still keep it under the, you know, the, uh, under the uh, idea of not running it, not as a business and so on. So how do we then become Atmanirbhar? How does the university become Atmanirbhar? Atmanirbharta means self-reliance. Now, what is Atmanirbharta in this context? Sarvam paravasham dukkham, which means everything that is in others' control is painful. Sarvam atmavasham sukham. If all that I need to work with is in my control, then that is happiness. So in that context, we need to really look at the university and so on. So what are the principles for happiness? Courage to serve. Shateshu jayate shura. Among a hundred is born one valorous. Sastreshu cha pandita. Among a thousand is born an intelligent being. Vakta dasha sahastreshu. An orator among ten thousand. Data bhavati va nava. A true giver may or may not be born at all. Therefore, courage to serve is extremely important. The second is the essence of service. What is the essence of service? Ashtadasa Purana Veda Vyasa. He says, Ashtadasa Puranesh Vyasascha Vachanatvaya Paropakara Punyaya Papaya Parapidana. The essence of 18 Puranas of Sage Vyasa is to help others is a good merit. And Ashtadasa Puraneshu Vyasascha Vachanatvaya Paropakara Punyaya and Papaya Parapidana. To help others is good merit. And to trouble or hurt others is sin. Therefore, essence of service one must understand. And the third is the essence of giving. We have seen essence of service. Now we are seeing essence of giving. Shatahasta samahara samastra hasta sankira. Which means earn with hundred hands. Shatahasta samahara. Earn with hundred hands. Sahastra hasta sankira. And donate with thousand hands. That's the essence of giving. And serve, but not be affected. That's extremely important to be happy. You serve, but don't ask for praise. Udaye savita rakto raktashtastra mai tatha sampattau cha vipattau cha mahatame karupata. Udaye savita rakto rakta. The sun looks red while rising and setting. Great men, mahatame. Great men do remain alive in both sampattau cha vipattau, good and bad times. And then service has a very close relationship with knowledge and we should understand that context as well. Paropakarartham idam buddhi, brahmagyanartham jivanam. Paropakarartham idam buddhi is this intellect is for helping others. And Brahmagyanartam Jivanam, and this life is for gaining supreme knowledge. And in other words, one reaches supreme knowledge through service to others. And they are the building blocks of happiness. Service through education, there are several values and compassion, intellectual achievement, providing students with academic knowledge and skills. Most parents want their children to reach high standards in mathematics, English, history, science, and so on. Pro-social values, train students for responsible citizenship and prepare them for adulthood through socializing. Then economic competitiveness, social efficiency, provide students with skills and knowledge needed to be competitive in a global economy. Personal growth, help students find self-fulfillment, personal relevance, clarification of personal values, communication, self-expression skills, and development of effective learning skills. Now, all this goes towards creating a, uh, uh, you know, a complete individual. 
who then can aspire to be happy and magnanimous in all kinds of situations. Socialization and culture impart culture to students through great ideas and works of art, literary classics, and so on. Social change helps students become productive citizens of changing the social order through emphasis on social issues. Equal educational opportunity ensure that all students have the same kind of opportunities and problem solving teach them students to learn through development. One can't be happy if the mind does not involve itself in a development activity that looks at a complete individual. Now there are several teaching learning styles, archaic to modern. And how do we get these skills that I'm talking about built into a student? There is an authority style. The authority style is primarily used to lecture in an auditorium or a classroom. The delegator style for subjects that necessitate group work, peer feedback, or lab-based learning. Then you have facilitator style, encourage self-learning through increased peer to teacher learning. Demonstrator style, like the lecture or authority style of teaching, the demonstrator retains the authority. So many times when, when we go to the workshop, we see a demonstrator style. And finally, there is a hybrid style. Some teachers adopt an integrated teaching style that incorporates their personality, preferences, interests into their teaching. Now, Adi Shankaracharya also spoke about, he, he established several mathas. And in that process, he spoke about several pedagogies. He spoke about pedagogies, he spoke about andragogies, how to teach children, how to teach adults, and so on. His methods included Shravana Vidhi, Manana Vidhi, Nididhyasa Vidhi, Prashnottara Vidhi, Tarka Vidhi, Vyakya Vidhi, Adhyaropa Apavada Vidhi, Drishtanta Vidhi, Katakatan Vidhi, Upadesha Vidhi. Now, there are several similarities between our the Western style of looking at the teaching styles and the Adi Shankaracharya's exposition in terms of pedagogies. Now there is a tradition which we have forgotten and therefore we have lost. The unfortunately, except for Shravana Vidhi and Upadesha Vidhi, neither our schools nor our teachers experiment with any of the other methods. This results in teacher-centric education that can actually put off the student. Shungeri Sharada Pitam form, formed on the Itas of uh, Jurveda, or the Dwarka Pitam formed on Samaveda, or Jyotir Mata Pitam formed on Atharva Veda and Govardhana Mata formed on Rig Veda. They have all followed Acharya's pedagogies and they still follow. If you go to their schools, they still follow the same methodologies and therefore, there is a certain amount of understanding and there is a certain amount of connect with the environment that they have. It, however, is extremely unfortunate that our universities have chosen to discard all except two. What are they? Shravana Vidhi and Upadesha Vidhi. There is a classroom teaching. The teacher speaks, he gives Upadesh and the students only listen. Now, there are, there are, in a university structure, there are leaders, there are employees, there are faculty, there are so many different entities. We must define the role of employers, employees, leaders, and the interplay and engagement between these roles to create an internal energy that can translate into happiness for various groups. And interpersonal relationships becomes extremely important. Environment makes a big difference and the larger ecosystem must be defined. And therefore, what is happiness quotient and how this affects the interplay between various entities is something that becomes very, very important. Colin Powell once said, what is the role of a leader? Great leaders are almost always great simplifiers who can cut through the argument, debate and doubt to offer a solution everybody can understand. They follow simple uh, KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Now that's the role of a leader. Being responsible sometimes means pissing people off. Good leadership involves reasonably 
re uh, responsibility to the welfare of the group, which means that some people will get angry at your actions and decisions. But you cannot go back and say that, no, no, I'm, you know, I can't take action against so-and-so or I can't reward, reward so-and-so and so on. All this is inevitable if the leader is honorable. Trying to get everyone to like the leader is a sign of mediocrity. And the leader will avoid the tough decisions. They will avoid confronting the people who need to be confronted and they will avoid giving differential rewards based on differential performance because some people might get upset. Now, therefore, leaders have also have to have a role in the, in the overall working of an of a organization and, and, and so on. Now, the third principle is never neglect details. A leader should never, never ever neglect details. When everyone's mind is dulled or distracted, the leader must be doubly vigilant. Therefore, the kind of leadership that we have within our universities must inculcate the spirit of, you know, all, all these uh, uh, contexts that I'm trying to set. Strategy equals execution. All great ideas and visions in the world are worthless if they can't be implemented. So the leader must be practical. And uh, good leaders understand something else also. An obsessive routine in carrying out the details begets conformity and complacency. Shake the world, shake the system. Don't get into complacency. <clears throat> below the surface appearances. Keeping looking, keep looking below surface appearances. Don't shrink from doing so just because you might not like what you find. So therefore, it's very necessary to look deep and look below surface appearances. Don't look at something and make an opinion, but go deep, find out what it is, and so on. Now there is a mind game. The mind game says never let your ego get so close to your position that when your position goes, your go ego goes with it. Now this is extremely profound in the way it is said. And we need to really understand what this mind game and ego is all about. Sant Kabir Das said, Bura jo dekha na mai chala, bura na milia koi. Jo dil khoja apna mujse bura na koi. Realization of this truth is the end of ego. Bura jo dekha na mai chala, bura na milia koi. Jo dil khoja apna mujse bura na koi. So to control ego, control the mind. The mind game must be played. Be objective, rational, but compassionate. The mind control has something that, that said about it even within Bhagavad Gita. Uddharedatmana atmanam na atmanam avasadayet atmaiva atmano bhanduratmaiva ripuratmanaha. Elevate yourself through the power of your mind. Apka mind ko uddhar karo, elevate it. And not degrade yourself. Atmanam avasa, na atmanam avasadaye. Do not degrade yourself. For the mind can be the friend, friend and also the enemy of the self. Atmaiva atmano bandhuratmaiva ripuratmana. It can be your friend, it can be your enemy as well. Now, role of a leader and leadership. We have seen what a leader is, who a leader is. Now we'll see what a leadership is. Is the art of accomplishing more than the science of management says is possible. Most of the management schools teach this. Having realized what a firm but compassionate leadership is, let's see how employee engagement activities can be transformed into joyful goals, which becomes the second part of this uh, talk for me today. Now, in order to understand that joyful goals, we must understand what is employee engagement. Engaged employees, as defined by Gallup survey, are those who are involved in enthusiastic, involved in enthusiastic about and committed to their work and workplace. The American analytics company has given 12 elements of employee engagement, which is based on expectations, strengths, praise, relationships, development and purpose. Let's look at what they mean. Now, when we 
uh, when we are talking about all this, there is also a question of how do we actually select our employees? How do we select our faculty? Is there something that needs to be done in that space? Is it the same old method of advertising and calling somebody and then interviewing and then finding out uh, you know, if he is good enough or if she is good enough, things like that, the traditional methods. Organization doesn't really accomplish anything. Plans don't accomplish anything either. Theories of management don't much matter. Endeavor succeed or fail because of the people involved. Only by attracting the best people will you accomplish great deeds. Now, these are the things that one should look at and therefore getting the right people into an organization is extremely important if you want to preserve the internal energy of that organization. And that is what eventually moves to what we call as individual happiness and collective happiness. Now, what are the Powell's rules for picking people? Look for intelligence and judgment and most critically a capacity to anticipate, to see around corners. In a university context, these also become extremely important part in teaching. Look for loyalty, integrity, a high energy drive, a balanced ego, and the drive to get things done. These are the principles that drive happiness of the organization. There is a recruitment principle he proposes. Part one is use the formula P equal to 40 to 70, in which P stands for the probability of success and the numbers indicate the percentage of information acquired. And in the part two, he says, once the information is in the range of 40 to 70, go with your gut. Of course, the regulator won't agree. That's a different matter. But this, these are some golden principles to get the right people into an organization. Lead, now we look at leaders, their inter, uh, you know, the interplay, the relationships between leader, faculty, and employees. Now everyone must actually follow Jivesh Karunacha Api Maitri Teshu Vidhiyatam. Be compassionate and friendly. Jivesh Karuna, be compassionate. Api Maitri and be friendly. Teshu Vidhiyatam to all living beings. That's the principle of equity. Now, how does an employee be, how, do, how should an employee be? Nishitva yah prakramate na antarvasati karmanaha avandyakalo vashyatma savai pandita uchate. Whose endeavors are preceded by a firm commitment. Who does not take long rest before task is accomplished. Who does not waste time and who has control over his mind, that is an employee. And simhavat sarva vegena pata antar antyarthe kilartinaha. Those who intend to get work done, cast themselves on the task with all possible speed like a lion. That's the employer. So therefore we have seen how an employer should behave, how an employee should behave, and both of them should behave. There is, there is a certain amount of leadership confidence that we must talk about. The day soldiers, he, this is in the context of Colin Powell, he was the chief of army of staff in the US. He says the day soldiers stop bringing you their problems is the day you have stopped leading them. So therefore the leader must always, always look at their subjects and he should encourage them to bring the problems back to him. And if that doesn't happen, they have either lost confidence that you can help them or concluded that you do not care. Either case is a failure of leadership. And why should we care about boosting faculty employee engagement? Now, for joyful goals to be realized, we need to care the, for the employees. And therefore, we need to care about their engagement. And the, when, when the work is dull and tedious, you're not excited to do it or do it well. When you find the work enjoyable and challenging, the best will come. Therefore, boosting is required. And there are several you know, applications available. Companies have developed several applications. And when you try and do this, again, the Gallup survey found in that in high turnover organizations, it actually reduced turnover by 24%. 
and by having highly engaged employees. So engagement is extremely important. And it also improves the productivity and profitability. So let us see some ways of engagement. This engagement that I'm talking about between the employees and so on. So how do we realize the joyful goals? Well, now, in order to do that, we need to understand what are joyful goals, create a dedicated praise channel. You look at what the employees are doing, create a dedicated praise channel, and then try and address each one's concerns and praise them when they do good and so on. And there are also several, several tools available to do that, like Slack, Google Hangout, Cisco Spark, Leap, work zone, work zone, Chanty, Hive, and, and so many of them are there, which actually help you in you know, tracking the performance of your faculty, of your employees, and so on. And there are also applications like Group IO and so on, which also notice the hard work that is put in in terms of uh, the work profiles. The second is position employees as subject matter experts. Now, do not assume that your employees are useless and they can't do anything. You have to understand their individual strengths and you have to position them as subject matter experts when the time comes. And there is again a global culture report which found a 59% increase in engagement when people at an employee's company came to that employee for help. And universities are no different. And future universities are going to future students are going to be much more demanding in the universities of the future that I have spoken to you about. The third is re revise your onboarding. According to research, again, OC Tanner, 69% of employees are more likely to remain at an organization for at least three years if they experience great onboarding. Tell them what the university is, what the values of the university is, is what it stands for, and take him around the university, show him every single facility, make him a part of the university, and the onboarding will be joyful. Fourth is help your employees discover their workplace motivations. Understand each of the employee and see what motivates them. A key part of employee engagement. Again, there are several, several uh, applications available to uh, make them happen. Now, does one size fit all? Fit, every individual is different and therefore fit no stereotypes. Don't chase the latest management facts. Just because your management department says something, don't go after that. The situation, the context dictates which approach best accomplishes the team's mission. Meet with them one-on-one. One -on -one. Meet your employee, meet your faculty one-on-one. -on -one. It's easy for faculty and employees to begin to feel like just another worker in a sea of faces, especially if they are part of a large university. Therefore, you have to personalize their experience and so on. One-on-ones can be held weekly, monthly, or even quarterly, but it must be done. Then set challenging goals. Without goals, both organizational and individual, how will an employee know where they are supposed to go? What he's supposed to do? When a faculty comes in, is his job only to teach and go away? There are, so set the goals. Maybe there is a research that has to be done. Maybe there is a lab that has to be developed. Maybe there is a social connect that has to be created. Maybe, maybe there is an employee industry connect that has to be created and so on. So therefore you have to set challenging goals. Offer career development opportunities. There are again several reports on this and, and how it improves and so on. So career development opportunities is extremely important. If I come in as an assistant professor, when do I become an associate professor? When do I become a professor? When do I become a dean? Or some position that matters in an academic institution. So development opportunities are extremely important to be known by the employees. Connect them with a mentor. In the university, create mentors, create seniors as mentors who can handhold the entrance and give them the right advice and so on. Many companies such as LNT, TCS, Cognizant, LinkedIn, or universities like Benel, Kale, Matan, Amrutan, Damai, SRM, and maybe you are a MIT, 
they all pair their new hires with mentors or buddies from day one. And that helps by, by retaining the people and making them feel they are a part of the institution. Challenge the pros, challenge the professionals. Don't be afraid to challenge. They're, they're in a university, typically in a university, there are always people who will come back and say, I know everything and don't mess with me. Therefore, you need not be afraid to challenge the pros, even in their own backyard. For that, you must make yourself good enough to do that. Post all hands meetings. How often do you and your entire university get together? All hands meetings, as in all hands on deck, are a great way to make sure your entire team feels connected. Everybody does it. As a 100% remote team, every company like Wipro, LNT, ITL, TCS, whoever it is, they all do it. Universities also must do it. Let employees shadow different departments. Each of your team specializes in different things, but they all need to work together as a cohesive unit. You know why India doesn't produce a single product? It is because people work in silos. Their research is, is built in silos. They don't come together. Even within the department, two professors don't talk to each other. They do very good work, but that's about it. There is no communication and so on. So the leader must come here together to bring these people together, to set goals. Suppose the leader says that instead of publishing 10 papers, this year you publish for me five papers, but you get me one product. Now that's the way to lead the university systems. Organization charts and fancy titles count for next to nothing. You may have a very good name, you may have a very good organizational chart, they don't mean anything in the committee, in the way things are changing and developing in the world today. Involve your team in the creative process. There are a lot of creative processes happening within the universities and in everyone must be involved in that process. Send them care packages. Many people working from home, especially in this COVID times, during this pandemic, they feel isolated. And we have also seen several people taking their life in these times of you know, distress. Now, the one way of doing that is please send a care package. Why not send them some love through a care package? You can use an office snack delivery service, such as food. There are so many snack delivery services available and so on. And depending on the size you are, the university or organization, this may not be feasible for every employee, but simply surprising team members on occasion with a gift can go a long way in boosting morale. Find small unexpected ways to delight your employees. You know, one even can contract, contact dedicated community. There are several community champions. They are there even in India. And therefore you must engage them in you know, uh, surprising your employees in the unexpected ways or delighting them in unexpected ways. Grant flexible work options. Maybe it's a, a few times it's, it's always good to grant flexible work op options and the employees will feel engaged. They will feel equipped to do their best. And yet many universities and even companies still expect everyone to operate optimally in the nine to five schedule. That may not really work. And therefore this flexible time schedules can help. Especially in universities, some people work best in the mornings, others in the afternoon. Some prefer to work in intense sprints while others prefer to work in study longer sessions. I had one professor in my institution who was extremely good in uh, research, but not, I mean, uh, he was not, I won't say that he was not interested in teaching or not good at teaching. He was extremely good at doing even that. But we all made enough avenues for him, opened enough avenues for him to do research and so on. And flexible times we gave him because he was, he, he, he used to come to institute around four o'clock in the evening and stay through the night. Your university rules may not agree to that but then you will have to make those exceptions. Have fun in your command. Don't always run at a breakneck pace. Take leave when you have earned it. Spend time with your families. And the corollary is surround yourself with people who take their work seriously, but not themselves. Those who work hard and play hard. 
So these are some of the things that we must really look at. Offer virtual workouts. This post-pandemic has shown us that several things can happen virtually. Getting a workout in with, uh, with your teammates, even if it is over Zoom, can result in some quality bonding time outside of strict work. I will ask you a question, how many university or whether you, if your university has really done this in times of this pandemic. Celebrate birthdays. Birthdays aren't work related, but it's always nice to know that your coworkers care about you. Reward work anniversary. Show your appreciation for another year of loyalty to your university by rewarding faculty and employees on their work anniversaries. These are all joyful goals. These are engagement activities. Use internal social media. It is useful or keeping in touch with friends, but what about coworkers and so on. And write the university. So you, you can actually generate, uh, create internal social media and keep that connect going. Write the university values and mission statement together. Let the, uh, the employees, the faculty, they, let them participate in, your universe, in creating university values, in creating those vision and mission statements and so on. <clears throat> and host AMAs, ask me anything. An AMA session can help keep employees in the loop or help them learn about new topics. During an AMA, people can submit any question they want. It just creates uh, that, that extra bit of bonding that we are talking about and showcase their talents. If a teacher is good in singing, if he's good in art, or if he's good at anything other than what the work that he has, if, if he is also good at other things, please showcase their talents. And that is another joyful goal. Host a virtual university retreat. You know, Agorapals, the makers of social media management software, faced a big challenge when their work retreat scheduled for April 2020 ended up coinciding with the global shutdown. They had to scramble to turn an in-person retreat into a virtual one using the platform. The Agora Pulse is a platform which you can use, whereby they were able to pull it off successfully and so on. Host a competition. And this helps in team bonding. This can be in the form of a talent show, a pub show or a hackathon between faculty, between employees, between employees and faculty and so on. Volunteer together, do everything together. Let, let there be activities designed where people come together to do them. Connect their purpose with their work. and. This I have saved. The, uh, this one I have saved for the last because though it's broad, it's also arguably the most important. According to the July 19 CNBC survey, workplace happiness poll, the number one contributor to overall happiness at work is feeling that your work is meaningful. Make that extra mile. Go that extra mile to connect their purpose with their work. Now let's look at happiness quotient. It's, it has a several things in, its, in place. There is an intellectual connect, there is an emotional connect, there's a physical connect, there's a spiritual connect, there's an environmental connect, social connect, and an occupational connect. All these things put together defines the happiness quotient. And these are the domains of happiness which make a difference. All the good things that you want in life and things like that. There is also a hedonistic treadmill. Hedonism means seeking pleasure and avoiding suffering at all times. You know, all the time you want only pleasure. You do not want any suffering. That is hedonism. And the hedonistic treadmill says, desire, I really want this. And then I satisfy the desire. And then I get some happiness out of it. It fades after some time. And then again, I get back to the same thing. It's like going on a treadmill up and down. Perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. The ripple effect of a leader's enthusiasm and optimism is awesome. So is the impact of cynicism and pessimism. Therefore, leaders must, must make that difference. Leaders who whine and blame engender those same behaviors among their colleagues. If the leader is one who keeps shouting at his subordinates. Probably a professor would go back to his department and start shouting at his subordinates. And therefore, this, this, that is not done. Perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. And that's what we must be all the time, optimistic. 
optimism together with certain basic human qualities can raise the happiness quotient. Now, what are those qualities that will be important for us to see? First is be humble. Namanti falino vruksha. Trees laden with fruits bend downward. Namanti gunino janaha. As the guni bows down out of respect to others. Shushka vruksha scha murkashcha na namanti kadachana. Murka means mur the, the, they are like the dry log that never bends. So you need to be humble in what you do. That's the first quality that you must have with optimism to go towards happiness. Be lazy and lose is the second quality. Alasasya kuto vidya. One who is lazy doesn't put in efforts. Avidyasya kuto dhanam. And wealth does not come to one without knowledge. One who is lazy and doesn't put in effort will not acquire knowledge. Alasasya kuto vidya. Avidyasya kuto dhanam. Wealth does not come to one without knowledge. Adhanasya kuto mitram. In such bad times, one cannot make good friends. Amitrasya kuto sukham. And happiness is far away from a person who doesn't have friends. Amitrasya kutas come. And in Panchatantra, most of us must have studied this. Work, work and not luck pays. Don't depend on luck. Work is something that pays. So do work. Udyoginam purushasimham upaiti lakshmi daivahi daivam iti kapurushavadanti daivam nihatya karu kuru Paurusham Atma Shakyata and Yatne Krute Yadi Nasidhyati Ko Atra Dosha Goddess Lakshmi Udyoginam Purushasimo Upaiti Lakshmi Goddess Lakshmi always stays with the industrious people who work. Only with the people who work, Goddess Lakshmi stays with them. Everything depends on the luck, is the thinking of the lazy people. Daivahi Daivam Iti Ka Purushavadanti. Therefore, we should leave apart the luck and devote ourselves daivam nihatya kuru paurusham atma shakya therefore we should leave apart the luck and devote ourselves to the hard work yatne krude yadina siddhati ko atra dosha if full efforts are made but desired results are not coming there is no harm but do work compassion for happiness we need compassion and that's extremely important Shanti tulyam tapo nasti tosha anna paramam sukham nasti trushna paro vyadhirna cha dharmo daya para. There is no penance like peace. Shanti tulyam tapo nasti. There is no greater happiness than satisfaction. Tosha anna paramam sukham. Nasti trushna paro. There is no greater disease than desire. Vyadhirna cha dharmo daya para. And there is no greater dharma than mercy and compassion. Dalai Lama said about compassion, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. So compassion becomes extremely important. And happiness means having all your feelings, positive and negatives included. Do good. The next, the other quality is do good. Do good to others. Paropakaraya falanti vrukshaha. Paropakaraya vahanti nadhyah, paropakaraya dhuhanti gavah, paropakarartha nidam shariram, paropakaraya falanti vrukshah, means what? For paropakar, to, to do good to others, trees give fruits, paropakaraya vahanti nadhyah, the rivers flow to do good, paropakaraya dhuhanti gavah, the, the cows give milk for others. And paropakarartha midam shariram, this, this body is to do help, to do good to others. And these are the ornaments. Aishwaryasya vibhushanam sujanata shauryasta vaksamyamo jnanasyo pashamaha shrutasya vinayo vittasya patre vyayaha akrodasta pasakshama prabhavitu dharmasya nirvyajata sarvesham api sarvakarana midam shilam param bhushanam. Might is ornamented by benevolence. Aishwaryasya vibhushanam sujanata. 
heroism by restraint in speech shauryastavak samyamam knowledge by patience fame by humility wealth by donating suitably ascetic practice by controlling anger powerful lord by ability to forgive religious practice by honesty but only good conduct is the best ornament any person can have and that is the biggest reason for happiness and what is the ultimate goal we all have an ultimate goal through our actions we seek fulfillment peace and satisfaction but since our actions differ in the context and environment around us the kind of happiness we derive out of our work will also be different i said there is a context for happiness as well a shloka in bhagavad gita again says sukham tvidanim trividham shrunu me bharatrasya bha abhyasatra ardamate yatra dukhanta cha nigachati there are three types of happiness satvik rajasik and tamasik of which the most cherished is only satvik so therefore if you want eternal happiness practice satvik way of life for eternal happiness abhyasadramate yatra dukhanta cha nigachati follow satvik way of life for eternal happiness what is bliss finally if we manage even half of what we have learned today we will be happy and contented i'll tell you a small paradox that happens that uh, that uh, is there in, in the way we uh, learn uh, and understand sukhiya sab sansar hai khaye aur soye dukhiya das kabir hai jaage aur roye said sant kabir and the para it's it's paradoxical but it's it's true and in in uh, upanishads it said sarve bhavanti sukhina sarve santu niramaya sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kashchid dukha bhaga bhavet all should must be happy be healthy see good and may no one have a share in sorrow but while doing this all must be happy see good may no one have a share in sorrow they also must do their duty they also must help others they also must do that otherwise what kabir said kabir das said will will become a true uh, truth sukhiya sab sansar hai khaye aur soye dukhiya das kabir hai jaage aur roye now in the skanda purana again veda vyasa said see a guru, we all need a guru to see that happiness is realized and only a guru can lead you to happiness he is the personification of knowledge brahmanandam param sukhadam kevalam jnana murtim attain bliss of brahman the supreme joy brahmanandam param sukhadam kevalam jnana murtim dvandvaditam gagana sadrusham tattvamasya lakshyam ekam nityam vimalam achalam sarvadhi sakshi bhutam bhavatitam trigun rahitam sadgurum tam namami attain bliss of brahman the supreme joy be pure free from delusion dvandvatitam gagana sadrusham be pure free from delusion and an embodiment of wisdom tattvamasya de lakshyam be beyond the duality of the world ekam nityam vimalam achalam eternal without impurities immovably established in truth sarvadhi sakshi bhutam be witness to everything bhavatitam triguna rahitam sadgurum tam namam beyond the mind the emotions without the three gunas of sattva rajas tamas salutation to that holy guru so therefore that uh, you need a guru is extremely important and work out your own sal- salvation do not depend on at- others is atmanirbharata and that is how you attain your happiness in the, in the world and move towards eternal happiness or bliss or somewhere you raise your uh, your own um, natural frequency by uh, taking recourse to yoga meditation and other ways of uh, controlling your mind so that you move towards et- eternal happiness and bliss and which which 
I mean, I, I wouldn't sit up right now, maybe one in a million would be there or maybe one in 10 million would be, would it be possible for someone to, to transcend towards Stita Prajna. But I believe uh, what I have said makes some sense today. And I hope all of you have, uh, have really uh, gone through this presentation with the animity that uh, it uh, deserves. Thank you so much and giving me the opportunity. Uh, we will connect now through some question answers or whatever. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. It, uh, one cannot expect much uh, more better than what you have started with. And this has given a big push to the momentum of our learning process for the five days. I'm sure all the participants will agree with what I'm saying, okay, the vision, the way that uh, Dr. Manthasar has given to us, uh, it's like an uh, avalanche for all of us. Yes, we would love to be inside this avalanche of his knowledge and his wisdom. And we would like to take some questions. Uh, so first of all, I would like to ask a few questions that we have in our mind before audience can ask. I am asking some uh, panelists or some uh, participants who can join. Few of them have joined. Dr. Pankaj Prakash, can you put yourself on camera, please? I think you, we have put you on. Uh, yes, you can take time. Sir, the courage. Sir, I remember, I want to say, I remember one essay of an IAS exam. And in that exam, it was asked, write an essay on courage. So one candidate got full on full on that exam uh, question. And what he did was okay, he left that paper blank and he just wrote, this is courage. And everybody wrote it full on full means pages by pages they were writing. They didn't succeed in that. But this man who succeeded in the exam of IES when exam essay came for courage, he left blank. So sir, uh, as you said, okay, beyond mind and mind courage to serve. But if I want whatever you have said, the various tools, the various ways to engage the employees in the organization to make them happy. Uh, if you would like to pinpoint uh, two, okay, these two are the first to start with this. This is the most effective. Like I said, it's Brahmastra, it's Astra, it's Astra, it's Astra, it's Astra. So the Shastri, the Shatriya, they have all the Astra. But which one they should start with the first one? Since you have seen the university system from the top of affairs, means helm of affairs, what you would like to suggest to all the participants, start with these two in your universities, in your college, and you will make the wonder immediately. Sir. The first is uh, you, have to be, you have to be truthful to your uh, work that you are doing. And, uh, uh, you know, understand the, uh, your own ecosystem in uh, which you are operating. And uh, once you are truthful to yourself, you start realizing your goals and working towards those goals. And in that process, there is nothing like, uh, you know, uh, cutting out someone else or trying to uh, be, uh, trying to show one upmanship, things like that. So it's very necessary that uh, people uh, must uh, have goals and uh, realize those goals um, through work, through dedication, and uh, through honesty. Now that's that's extremely important. Having said that, the environment also must provide those uh, uh, avenues. Uh, for example, like I, like I said, the leaders must be understanding, must be considerate, uh, and. Uh, uh, make the faculty feel at home within the university systems. And uh, uh, normally what we find is the uh, faculty are pretty much uh, on their own in a, in a university. And uh, uh, if they are, they, are, they are not connected either with their fellow uh, teachers uh, or with the management, with the leadership. So therefore, uh, what the faculty must do is set some goals. The goals could be 
six months, very, very immediate. And they also must be long term. And the immediate goals must be uh, realized through uh, hard, uh, through work, through passion, compassion for others, and uh, a, a certain amount of uh, truthfulness to themselves and to others. Then probably they will realize their goals. Uh, and by realizing their goals, they'll start feeling that uh, they are progressing. And that's what matters. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Bhavya, do you have a question to ask? Okay. Dr. Pankaj Prakash, you have a question to ask? Okay, maybe there's some issues. Sir, I want to move to the next question. Sir, uh, the new policy has come now. The NEP has come. Uh, yes, Bhavya ma'am is here. Yes, Bhavya, can you unmute yourself, please? And you can ask your question, please. Yeah, but unmute, just unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Not the video, uh, sound, unmute. It's at the left side, bottom left. Okay, maybe. So the new policy has come for the, this NEP has come. So there is a huge kind of, uh, what we say, uh, feeling coming up that this is the new thing and this is the one which is going to change the way the system is going to work for long. I mean, students will be happy, teachers will be happy, careers will go very high. So how do you see, sir, is, uh, how do you see that? Is this a new happy mantra given by the government in the area of education? No, there can't be a happy mantra that anybody can give. It's, uh, it's something that uh, the people will have to work out for themselves. They, uh, NEP has uh, some pointers to uh, what is uh, what our Honorable Prime Minister keeps saying, Atmanirbharta. And uh, what it uh, really means is in, in some sense it, it means self-reliance, but there are many other facets to that. So the NEP only gives certain pointers to realize those uh, other facets of uh, what Atmanirbharta is all about. Now, of course, there are some good uh, things uh, within the uh, policy uh, where uh, uh, the connect with the industry can happen. Like for example, the academic uh, credit uh, bank uh, uh, provision, then the multi-point entry exit system that uh, has yes. been given, uh, which is similar to the national skill qualification framework. And uh, these, these have a way of uh, connecting with the industry. For example, today, if a student gets into a BSc program, then uh, he has to do complete those three years and then he gets a BSc degree and then he uh, starts finding a job. But uh, the, the policy envisages uh, that uh, he can drop out after one year also, after 12 and get a certificate and maybe look for a job or do something else. Now the challenge really is in, uh, though, though it's a very good uh, uh, system to connect with the industry and to help people learn at their pace. And uh, it also helps people who cannot probably find time the whole three years, four years like that. Uh, so therefore uh, it does give them an opportunity, but the challenge really is in creating the curriculum for that kind of uh, uh, entry exit uh, systems. Uh, for if if somebody has to, you know, uh, get into an employment after one year of uh, after twelve, then a certain job role must be defined in the industry for him to be placed at that uh, position. So unless the industry also is in uh, sync with the policy, and they also create job roles at every certification level. For example, one year after 12, two years after 12, three years after 12, what are the kind of outcomes and so on. If all that can be done, maybe it, uh, it does help. But there is a certain amount of, there is an attempt within the uh, policy document to see that things are streamlined and uh, that people uh, who connect have uh, a lot more bonding than what used to happen in terms of they're also talking about, about multidisciplinary research, multi multidisciplines on one campus 
and so on. Though it's not a new idea, the original, original universities all started with multiple uh, departments and disciplines. Over a period of time, there, there were no takers there were, because they were not connected with the employment and people, the students started dropping out and eventually their departments closed down. So, and uh, a modern university will find only a few, three, four departments together and so on. So therefore, the kind of multidisciplinary research that used to happen earlier is not happening anymore now. And within the departments also, it's very difficult for people to come together, just to start working together and so on. So therefore, those those things are not happening. But But the trust in the policy to bring that concept back uh, does uh, show that the the uh, the, uh, the government is uh, on the right track, and therefore, they their uh, their uh, one of the outcomes uh, of the policy is actually atmanirbhartha, and therefore it it does help them in that uh, process. Uh, having said that, how the uh, the the leaders react, how the university vice chancellors react, how the faculty react how the employees react and uh, what kind of uh, benefits they can accrue from the uh, policy uh, framework is something that they will have to discover themselves. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities of uh, working together is, is there within the policy. And that is where a certain amount of uh, uh, happiness and, and so on, those, those kind of things can be built into, into the uh, overall working of a university, but otherwise, uh, it it does need a lot of uh, uh, the reforms need a lot of uh, you know in order that the reforms are implemented, uh, you need a lot of funding, and that probably would be made available within the system. So therefore, the overall objectives of the policy will be realized at some point of time. Okay, sir. Sir, I have some questions from different campuses of MIT and the other participants. So I'm just trying to club few of them. So this is a little uh, complex question, which I'm trying to make it out. So there are three words, dependence, independence, and interdependence. Out of these three words, dependence and independence, it is said that they are false words. The, uh, the truthful word is interdependence. So if we understand, if we try to see these three words, so Atmanirbhar is something like independence. So if anybody want to be independent or Atmanirbhar, it means, is he going to cut off himself from other or he is going to uh, depend on his own resources, own capacities, like for example, of our faculty, maybe a student, if he becomes Atmanirbhar, does it mean he has to depend only his own resources? He live in his silos, like an institution, does they live in silos, no partnership, no collaboration? Is this Atmanirbhar? So what context uh, we can give uh, some idea to our participants, what that could be? No, first Thank of you. all, uh, independent doesn't mean that uh, you uh, need not, or you should not depend on anybody. First of all, that uh, is, uh, is not right. Now, uh, in, uh, Atmanirbhartha doesn't, self-reliance doesn't mean that, uh, you don't uh, need any, anyone's help. Everything will be done uh, internally. It doesn't really mean that. Uh, in, in this globalized world, you can't have that for, for in the first place. Uh, for example, you look at any, any industry, your own, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether it's an industry, whether it's a university or whatever, there's so much of collaboration happening and uh, ideas are shared and, and things like that. So, Independence doesn't uh, uh, mean that I have to cut off myself with the rest of the world and therefore everything I have to do, it, it doesn't work like that. Now, depend on the other, other side, on the other extreme uh, side, uh, dependence also doesn't mean that I have to depend on every, everybody. So there is, a, uh, there is an amount of interdependence built into both these words. And there is a lot of interdependence built into the uh, Atma Nirvarta that people are talking about. For example, I can be Atma Nirvar provided I uh, use the context in which I live to the best of my ability, to the best of my uh, goals. So 
there is it for example is it possible that uh, i can have uh, the entire uh, need of uh, petroleum products uh, within the country i don't have that uh, uh, freedom uh, to make that statement so therefore if i go out and ask for uh, uh, you know uh, petroleum products to be purchased do i become dependent or do i uh, give away my my independence things like that so therefore uh, there is an amount of interdependence built into our lives whether uh, whatever way we look at it and that also is atmanirbharta and there are uh, uh, there are several ways of it's it's the it's the independence of the mind don't be shackled into uh, accepting blindly what you get within the system or within your environment that is atmanirbhar so do not okay so get into the habit of uh, you know uh, uh, surrogating your mind to someone else and say that whatever the other fellow says is fine with me so you uh, have your independence of thinking independence of your uh, thought process uh, and that that's atmanirbhar that's so wisely said sir sir i heard about uh, dhirubhai ambani he has given a formula for success to his two son and he said three c's three c's one c is crony crony means friend second c is chela third c is chamcha those who are not able to understand chela chela is something like somebody who is saying yes 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 man something like that sorry uh, the inner chamcha means the one who is a yes man and chela means somebody who can say no to the boss also so he gave this formula to his two son he said ke you should ensure avoid all the chamchas you should avoid them give them the task but avoid them number two is chela you should have some chelas in your life and you should uplift them and the number 3 is have at least one good friend in your life because in front of that person even if you stand naked professionally in your profession he can slap you he can shout on you and you won't mind it so sir i want to ask if sir, you have seen so much of uh, educational world and you have made draft policies which we all work on sir do you have some kind of a small uh, nuggets of uh, wisdom in terms of like 3c something like that ke okay? this is my abc formula something like that do you have something sir which you follow up, like in your university or in your life if you want to give uh, a crisp something answer sir like no for, for, first of all uh, <clears throat> the what uh, uh, the example that you gave what i mean chela and things like that i mean these these are okay in terms of uh, you know Uh, when there is a world outside which is uh, which depends which which uh, actually uh, works only on uh, you know the result at the end of the day and uh, therefore there is a certain amount of understanding that everyone is doing it and therefore i will also do it now that right. is not that is not acceptable in uh, in a uh, in a life which must be built on truthfulness and honesty now as far as uh, mantra or whatever i mean i i don't think i i am uh, so big to give uh, mantra or has so much of wisdom to give a mantra sir, sir, but any short any yeah yeah, any... yeah the the idea is independence of mind is extremely important i mean i uh, even in the earlier question there was uh, atmanirbharta and what is atmanirbharta and so on i mean self reliance is fine in a in a physical sense there is a certain amount of dependence on uh, other people other uh, ways of doing things and and so on because that's the way we are built today it's a global world it's a global economy and everything is global therefore even in education it must be uh, collaboration that must help as it helps in other areas but having said all that atmanirbharta also talks about a metaphysical level there is a physical level at which we understand it as self reliance or whatever 
or independence or as people have said but at a metaphysical level it also talks about the independence of the mind independence of the thought process and therefore in, in that context i'll just tell you that uh, in your in your uh, work uh, uh, space whether you are a leader whether you are a professor what whatever you are in in your space of working uh, there will always be people who will come and uh, start saying uh, yes sir yes sir you are right you are right you are right and so on and seldom very seldom we start arguing on uh, principles and uh, uh, you know with the with the leaders and so on now if that happens it is it very simply means if if there is a yes man around you for everything that you are doing then i would say that one of you is is redundant now which which means that uh, he doesn't need you if you if you are if you only can contradict him and uh, tell him what is right what is wrong and argue it uh, with an independence of mind only then it, the the uh, the knowledge would Im- improve the learning would happen and uh, the leader also would should be magnanimous enough to accept those uh, things and so on and that that's the way to build the uh, build the synergy within the organization that so so i would say that be uh, realistic be analytical uh, never uh, accept something at face value unless it's a postulation if it's a postulation you accept that if it is not everything is subject to reason and everything is said in a context so realize the context realize the re- uh, look at the reasoning and uh, believe uh, if something is right and then you go with everything that you have uh, to realize that so thank you so much sir it has been a privilege listening to you and uh, i'm sure the, all the participants have taken a treasure of knowledge Uh, that is being transpired by you for the last 90 minutes it feels like the knowledge is uh, still not going to leave us even if we attend any other session and your knowledge your word of wisdom will be around us in our minds and thoughts for all the five days thank you so much for your time sir, sir give me a chance uh, to ask one question please yes Mr. i hope yes, yes no problem continue so, uh, please my question is many people lost their job in pandemic uh, covid 19 sir and uh, uh, then they turn to uh, the farming sector uh, as so a very intellectual person too so when we talk about our farmers we must speak on rural industrialization sir how we can look as alternative for that and uh, where we are that means uh, we were talking about uh, uh, atmanirbhar so uh, how we can uh, you know uh, explain this concept that uh, uh, farming uh, uh, that means rural industrialization is the, is the uh, will be the alternatives for uh, farming sector because it is uh, correlated to the uh, to that people only uh, those who have uh, you know lost their job in pandemic so that's my question sir no the the point is first of all there is no alternative to farming there are their farming is something that's extremely essential and people who are in it must be facilitated enough to be on the job be in farming and uh, keep uh, improvising innovating so that the uh, yield is much better and their returns are much better and they eventually are happy so uh, people who lose jobs and getting into farming is is something that uh, uh, i mean if they, some of them may may do it if they have the means uh, to do it uh, but uh, i do not think uh, most of the people would actually do that but having said that the ha- uh, happiness uh, is a, is a way of life you, you one will have to uh, within the profession that one has they will have to look at the uh, boundary conditions operate within that space every context has a certain boundary that is defined you can't go out and say that i am unhappy and therefore uh, uh, even within farming there are obviously a, a, we all know there is a lot of hard work within farming and farming sector and so on and therefore the uh, and therefore because they have a direct connect with the society and and uh, the nation at uh, large their uh, the requirements must be looked at with the uh, most uh, you know appropriate uh, sense 
but uh, having said that uh, every every industry whether it's farming or anything else they uh, must uh, find the happiness within the boundaries in which they operate your 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 mic your speaker is muted uh, thank you so much for your time once again and uh, i would like to thank on behalf of all the participants that you have taken time from your busy schedule and uh, thank you so much sir